Good morning. Uh, first, I'm going to take you through a story uh, briefly about an office park nearby called Rambler Park. So Rambler Park is just half a mile from the office site itself. It has suffered a lot of the same issues. In 2013, it was 58% occupied. 33 month hold period, 2016, it was sold with 88% occupancy. So Glen Lakes Medical Plaza is not the same uh, office building, obviously, but it has many of the same issues that Rambler Park suffered. And today we're gonna take you through those issues and then identify a solution. Um, my name is Sam. I'm gonna take you through the site analysis. I know you've been briefly briefed on the property itself, but I'm gonna go more in depth on that. Uh, Johnny and Austin are gonna take you through the market overview, uh, go more in depth on the market itself. Ryan will then take you through analysis of alternatives, go through what we looked at, uh, why we think it's a, some of them are bad ideas, and then Gunnar and Nick are gonna take you through the reposition strategy and our comprehensive solution to get to 95% occupancy. So the site itself, there's plenty of access uh, along North Central Expressway. You have access from the south, and then you also have access from the south along Walnut Hill and Meanderville Lane from the north and south, and then that goes to Glen Lakes. Dart Rail is 0.3 miles from the site itself, so you have a, about a six minute walk. The site is 132 and a half feet frontage along North Central Expressway, 300 feet of frontage on Glen Lakes Drive, and it's about nine tenths of an acre. Access, as I mentioned, Glen Lakes uh, Drive is the main access point, so you have access to the east lot, which gives you subterranean uh, parking access, as well as the west lot, which gives you access uh, to the west lot, and then you have the alleyway access to the west lot as well. General office zoning, so pretty uh, open as far as what you can do in general office. Uh, it's currently being used as a medical office, which requires a higher parking ratio at five per thousand, and traditional office and a general office zoning is about three per thousand. And then property analysis, you have, uh, it's a five-story masonry construction built in 1981. Uh, addition was made in 1985 and 2014 and 2015 additional capitals expended on common area um, maintenance, uh, common area replacements, bathroom updates, uh, as well as deferred maintenance. The property itself is 64,000 gross square feet. 53 net and 21,000 of which is currently vacant, which is about a 40% vacancy rate. Uh, the property, is, the common areas are pretty dated. Um, renovations are needed throughout interiorly, including elevators. It kind of smells on the first two floors, which is kind of something <laughs> you worry about with uh, medical office, smells of smoke actually, which is def definitely a worry. Exteriorly landscaping, deferred maintenance, um, and then parking lots are dimly lit at night, which you can see. And a few of these pictures on the right is the front elevation, and then the two left are some of the parking lots uh, during the evening hours. And so some of the strengths of the property is its location it is located on US 75 North, so it's very centrally located, walking distance to retail, as well as a dark Walnut Hill station. Weaknesses are parking, they did interior, and with that, opportunities are to update the interior, at least the office tenants to get a lower parking ratio and update uh, common areas and increase TI. Um, so some of the biggest threats is finding a parking solution, which we will outline, outline later, as well as just market risk uh, that's generally in this general office vicinity. So with that, Johnny will take you through one of the biggest strengths, which is location. Thanks, Sam. So to start off the market analysis, we looked on a macro scale to the DFW market. We found that in 2018, it was a very healthy market uh, with results such as positive net absorption and below average vacancy sitting at 15%, which is around 2% lower than the historical average for the office market in DFW. Then we narrowed it down to the submarket, the Central Expressway submarket. You can see shaded in gray is the submarket. It extends as far south as the Dallas CBD and as far north as Forest Lane, which is just south of the LBJ Freeway. And then finally, we look to the subject neighborhood. Uh, on the map here, you can see outlined in red is the neighborhood, and then outlined is yellow. In the yellow is the micro neighborhood. And Austin will walk you uh, through this further on later in the presentation. So one of the main advantages of this building actually is its close proximity to public transit. You can see the left marker um, is the Glen Lakes Medical Plaza, and then the right marker is the DART station. As Sam noted earlier, it's three-tenths of a mile, it's less than three-tenths of a mile to the DART station. 
so very accessible in terms of public transportation, as well as the fact that there's a bus stop on the northwest corner of the property. So both with um, the bus system as well as the DART system, it's very easy for tenants and for customers to, uh, to access the building. Next we looked, we analyzed vacancy. And uh, we can see a few important things on this graph. First, I'd like you to look on the green line here. This, that is the Central Expressway submarket. And you can see that it's very healthy, sitting at 12%, uh, roughly 3% lower than the uh, DFW market, office market as a whole in terms of vacancy. So it, it definitely is healthier than DFW as a whole. And then you can see the huge gap between our building, which is the orange line, sitting at, let's call it 36% vacancy currently, which goes to show the just the potential possibilities in terms of rent growth over the next five to ten years because it is so much higher than the average building in the Central Expressway submarket. This is also seen through this next graph which shows gross asking rent. You can see again how low um, the medical plaza is, this orange line, which is at $21 a foot, and then the green line up top is the Central Expressway submarket, which is uh, sitting at $28. And then also you can see the forecasted growth over the next five years, and you can see that rents are continue are expected to continue to grow up to twenty or thirty-two dollars a foot by the end of two thousand twenty-three. Um, the submarket does have uh, good rent growth currently, and it has over the past few years. Although Glen Lakes Medical Plaza hasn't experienced any rent growth over the last twelve months, as you can see right here, uh, the submarket, the two to four star buildings within the submarket have seen about five and a half percent year over year rent growth. Um, which is obviously a very good sign for the submarket. Now, if you look to the forecast, you can see that the rates are expected to decrease, the rent growth rates are expected to decrease. However, I would like you to note that there's still positive rates, so even though the market's softening, we're not gonna see a big dip in the market like we did 10 years ago, where rents are expected to fall because they're, they're still gonna be growing just at a slower pace. Next, um, it's not as good of a uh, view for net absorption in the submarket. The past two years, as well as the beginning of this year, the Central Expressway submarket has experienced negative uh, net absorption. However, if you look to the graph on the right, which shows net absorption as a percentage of inventory, you can see that the current rate is positive. So if that continues to grow, we'll be in positive net absorption relatively soon, even though we're still negative currently. Next, we can see the uh, uh, heavy amount of construction proposals in the pipeline. There are about four buildings that are either under construction or being proposed. However, all four of these buildings, uh, after we conduct our analysis, we deem they were not actually direct comps to our building. So we don't think that this should be an issue in terms of, um, uh, in terms of leasing our, our building and meeting the objective of 95% occupancy. Here you can see that there's relatively low construction overall within a three mile radius. 2019, there's less than 200,000 square feet proposed, which is far below the all-time average of, of roughly 450,000 square feet. Here, uh, you can see that there are higher than average deliveries in May, which isn't necessarily a good thing for our building um, because it is so far uh, ahead of the all-time average, right at 30,000 square feet. It's actually expected to be 120,000 square feet. But with the implement, implementation of our plan, um, we don't believe that, that this should be an issue after we renovate the building and, and, um, and do the various things that we have in our plan. Finally, the comparable property analysis. We, com uh, we found that there are four property direct, comp, uh, direct comps to our property. The first one is 10 to 10. The second one is 10 to 60. 10300 and 10400 and there are more details in your um, in your materials that we handed out but an overall summary would be that uh, all of them are very similar in age similar in rent and similar in size yet they're all significantly lower in vacancy rates uh, which is why the building needs to be um, restabilized and rehabilitated through our plan so now I'm going to hand it off to Austin to talk more about location analysis and demographics <coughs> Okay, starting with uh, businesses and employees in the area, healthcare and retail take up most of the, most of the businesses in the area with just under 50,000 daily employees in that three mile radius. Uh, next we have population, and uh, I'd like you to note from 2010 to 2018, we saw a good uh, rebound, and we continue to see growth in population. Uh, we attest this to the 3,500 multifamily units we see coming. In terms of muni municipal services, um, you can see Texas Health Presbyterian Hospital is right around the block with uh, Medical City Dallas, no more than three miles north of the subject property. 
Uh, you can also see there are a couple of schools in the area, St. Mark's being one of them. Retail is next, uh, and in terms of retail, you're in the middle of Dallas uh, with North Park is, uh, in particular, uh, and right across US 75 is the shops at Park Lane. Um, I'd also like to note uh, there are several restaurants in the Preston Hollow Village too. And now in terms of traffic, um, the subject property is right off of exit six on US 75, which sees um, hundreds of thousands of daily traffic each day. And in terms of signage and marketability of the property, that's a, that's a big plus. <clears throat> Overall, um, one, it's a central expressway submarket. So again, signage and marketability of the property is extremely uh, valuable here. Two, low construction pipeline in terms of new construction in the area in terms of uh, office buildings. Three, uh, rents are expected to grow, just not at the rapid pace of, that they were the past 10 years. And four, the market is softening, but we don't expect a significant drop. Uh, I'm now gonna pass it on to Ryan, and he's gonna discuss the alternative analysis. Awesome. <clears throat> so one of the biggest things that you need to consider when repositioning an asset is to identify critical issues, the solutions, as well as alternative solutions. First and foremost is the parking shortage. With current owners are unable to lease up the entire building and capitalize on potential revenue, given the parking requirements of five and one for the medical designation. Second being vacancy. Once we solve the parking shortage, we are then freed up to implement a, to implement a lease up strategy that would stabilize at 95% occupancy. Third is asset condition. This ties in directly with vacancy. Once we go past the asset condition hurdles as well as parking shortage, we're able to implement our repositioning strategy. Fourth being additional considerations. Parking shortage, vacancy, and asset condition are the three most critical issues that we need to examine. But things like market trends, potential increases in operating expenses, as well as missed opportunities and potential income are all things that we need to analyze. In terms of parking shortage, the first consideration and most obvious would be to build out new parking spots. Though this is not necessarily feasible for our asset, it would cost nearly $1.4 to $1.5 million to construct a ground up parking structure in the adjacent lot, not to mention the land acquisition costs. It would cost even more to redevelop our already in place subterranean parking. Utilizing public transportation as a commuting strategy is very popular, especially in a place like Dallas and Dallas' central business district and accessible through the DART. Though this would not necessarily be feasible and would lower our parking ratio because our 0.27 distance from the closest station, Walnut Hill, is just outside the required distance. With new technology comes new opportunity. An example of this is subsidized ride sharing. We've seen office landlords use, utilize this strategy and cut parking costs as well as attract new tenants by providing subsidized ride sharing for prospective new tenants. While this is not necessarily something we do right now, it's something we would consider in the future when it's a more proven strategy. Finally is collective parking. What we see in many office parks is property managers going to third party parking management companies such as Platinum. We see them operate in uptown and downtown. This wouldn't necessarily be feasible for our asset because the availability within the area as well as the incurred expenses. In terms of vacancy, the first thing we considered was to continually keep it as a designation as medical. We would be able to fetch higher rents, but it's still the issue of the parking ratio and we wouldn't be able to lease it up. If we were to go down this path, we would begin to market to off-hour clinic tenants. They'd be able to utilize these parking spots during outside of business hours, and that's how you get, your, get around the parking requirements. Third and final consideration in terms of vacancy would be restacking the tenant mix. We would hope to restack the tenant mix in hopes to market it to potential tenants to make a more desirable floor plan. In terms of asset condition, this ties in directly with our lease up strategy. In order to market it to new tenants, we need to revitalize the building. Um, for potential alternatives, you can have anything from landscape improvements to exterior building renovations. It just depends on capital intensive purposes. And though we didn't necessarily do these, uh, these are just some of the things we came up with. Finally, um, following parking vacancy and the asset condition, there was necessary considerations to analyze, such as the conversion to triple net. As Sam spoke about earlier, Rambler Park recently implemented this strategy. Our asset is currently operating with a rent structure at modified gross plus E. By converting to triple net, we would be able to forego potential increases in operating expenses. The next is a potential market downturn. 
The biggest looming fear for every commercial real estate professional is a potential market downturn. What's necessary to examine is that over the past 10 years, Dallas has added over approximately 100,000 jobs year over year. This makes it less susceptible to have a significant dip when this happens. The third would be expected expense growth. As we lease up the buildings, our expense growth would rise. This would cause an increase in operating expense as well as a potential loss in revenue. The fourth and final consideration is potential signage revenue. Currently, signage rights are written into the fourth floor lease, but given the fourth floor is not currently occupied, we would propose that we sell the signage rights. Uh, currently, a billboard on North Central Expressway near our asset goes for about $15,000 to $20,000 per month, so we think we could maintain a $4,000 per month on the potential signage. These are just a bunch of alternatives that we considered. We didn't necessarily think them the best solutions, and Gunner's going to be talking about what we did. Okay, thanks Ryan. So this is our repositioning strategy. Uh, the three main issues that we kind of identified, obviously, as he spoke about was the parking, vacancy, and asset condition. And so with parking, what we found to be the most practical solution, um, building out the subterranean, building out outside parking would be too capital intensive, we thought. So we decided to go with external renting and finding other opportunities, other properties around our property to lease. And then for vacancy, uh, we plan on restructuring an office lease strategy and then completely redoing the fourth floor and white boxing that. And then for uh, asset condition, uh, we uh, plan to spend a bunch of capital on common areas, elevator cabs, and then property lighting uh, with the redeveloped tenant improvement plan. And so here are kind of the areas that we were looking at uh, running spots from, as was earlier alluded to by Sam. We're dropping our parking ratio from five to three. And this is going to allow us to add only about 70 parking spots instead of the 118 that we needed. And so with these potential areas, we can get more than enough parking to satisfy these requirements. And so here's just some uh, examples of the common areas that we want to redesign. This kind of reflects what was with 10210 and 10260 in terms of their common areas. And we feel like this would be a good selling point for uh, potential tenants. And then uh, this is kind of the capital distribution that we came up with, 25% uh, going to parking and valet and lighting. Parking valet was a total around 170, 160,000. Um, so that $90,000 reflects the rented out spaces that we would do. The valet service would be passed on to the tenants. And so they would pick up some of that cost that would be specified in the lease agreements. And then the lighting fixtures, both interior and exterior, uh, this would increase the visibility, increase the attractiveness of the building, and be a good selling point as well. 35% uh, of the budget, these will go into renovations. Like I said earlier, the white box fourth floor renovation costing about uh, $85,000. And then the three elevator renovations, two elevators in the common areas, and then one elevator from the subterranean parking lot to the first floor. We would redo these, cost about $100,000, and would also be a good selling point for future tenants. And then for the common area improvements, 40% of the capital budget will be included in this area, roughly $200,000. Uh, this is a total of six corridors, and we want to do all the corridors in the first year, so we're able to lease the, uh, uh, the vacant units as fast as possible. Uh, we plan on doing one at a time, so it's not uh, as much of an encumbrance for the existing tenants. So here's some of the risks and exposures that we thought about using this value add opportunity. Obviously, if the market slows, uh, we're gonna get less rent um, and it's gonna be harder to actually lease up those spots. And then obviously the suite size, if this isn't what uh, the potential office tenants are looking for, this could be an issue um, moving forward. Uh, construction costs, uh, obviously if the construction costs exceed what we budgeted for, um, this could cause problems in terms of lower IRR and then uh, just a delayed uh, tenant improvement plan and a renovation plan. And then for competition, we have a lot of uh, supply within our area. And so if, obviously, if there's a lot of supply, there's a lot of people competing with our property, um, this could take potential tenants from us. And then obviously the new deliveries that Johnny talked about um, could saturate the market and lower demand overall. So here are some of the tenants that we identified to go for. 
for the white box space, that entire fourth floor, we're looking for one or two tenants um, to lease that area. This would lower the amount of tenants that we have overall and also help with our parking ratio requirements. And so some of the tenants that we identified were home health office, home health care consulting, and then a real estate firm. These are what we identified to be the most likely to rent it or to lease out that entire space. And then for the remaining suites, um, these are kind of the small accounting firms, family office, law firms. This is consistent with the uh, properties around us and just a, um, a good amount of business within uh, Dallas in general. And so these were the target uh, tenants that we're trying to lease up to. And then moving on to our marketing leasing strategy, our kind of motto is basically quality at a competitive price. And then so with the discount or rent, we're falling at $22 a square foot. This is kind of on the lower end of things, uh, the lower average for office buildings around our area. And this is obviously gonna be a good attraction for future tenants. And then our generous uh, tenant improvement package, uh, we're starting at 35 bucks a square foot. Um, this is included for the potential tenants for office and also the existing medical tenants once they roll. If they want to renew their lease, they're given the same exact package, which is favorable for releasing their spots after their lease expires. And then obviously, uh, as Sam alluded to, favorable location, really easy access, public transportation, and uh, highly visible from US 75. So I'll give this to Nick to go over the financial portfolio. So just a snapshot of our financial pro forma, we're looking at a going in cap rate of around 4%, which is artificially low due to our occupancy issues. And by year three, with our implementation of our plans, we're looking at a stabilized 8% and assuming a five-year hold, although the owner wants uh, or isn't interested in necessarily selling the asset, we would theoretically have about a 7% uh, exit cap, which is reflective of our year six NOI. And then down below, you can see some of the expenses from a high level, which include capital improvements as well as CapEx. And you'll see in our first two years of our project, we're actually showing a negative cash flow, and that's due to our heavy TI and LC costs from our leasing activity. With that, we plan to finance the improvements using a line of credit of approximately $500,000, which could also be increased to a million dollars to help ease some of the financial burdens of the TI and LCs. And to sum things up, we would first reposition the asset by uh, solving our parking issues with our valet service, as well as our uh, lease spots required for that followed by our building revitalization of the common areas, as well as the interior and exterior lighting. And then uh, lastly, we would finish with our leasing strategy, which includes discounted rents, as well as a generous CI package. And now I'll leave things off with Sam to close. So to close, I'm gonna go take you back to Rambler Park. So they went from 58% occupancy to 88% occupancy in a 33 month hold. They spent over two and a half million dollars to do this. Our budget is a fraction of that and will achieve the same results, if not better. We think with our plan outline and our analysis of other solutions, our budget will get to 95% occupancy within five years. I'd like to understand, how is adding valet going to help with the parking because you still have the same number of parking spaces so how does the valet help in in your parking scenario yeah i can i'll take that answer um so what we're marketing our marketing plan is to go for our office tenants so currently we're going to leave the tenants that are there in place and the new tenants are going to be office and that will be marketed at the three to one ratio so those office tenants will not need the five to one ratio so our calculation and getting the additional spaces, I think it's about 68 spots that we need to, if we lease up to 95% occupancy for the remaining spaces. And that would be through the valet system and as well as the valet system might still be mainly used by patients to so the current current building. And then the new office tenants will use the existing parking. So you're gonna lease some ground offsite, I think, Swalker. Correct. And yeah. valet back okay. and forth. Okay, I did not. Yeah. Okay, so you're you're gonna okay. I understand now. Yeah. And you're gonna pass that through as operating expenses. Correct. So I think I heard you were gonna renovate six corridors, right? Yes. So and uh, the building is six stories, six floors. 
How many corridors? It's five stories, correct. All right, so six corridors. So tell me how those corridors, how do you get that number? Is it, uh, is it, is it a wraparound corridor right now and you're gonna do one, two, three, four, five, six? I'm, where do you get six? Uh, I can take that too. The six corridor, we kind of compiled the, the uh, common areas so the elevator landings on each of the floors and counted that as one corridor instead of including that in the five. So it's five corridors on each, one on each floor and then the elevator landings on each floor okay. uh, compiled as one. And that gets me to my real question is, is why would you do that for the fourth floor if you're gonna white box? So on the fourth floor, the white box is just gonna be for the tenant uh, area versus, so the, the whole floor is gonna be white box, they're gonna redo the common areas. And then the current tenant that's there uh, that left left how it was and it's uh, I mean 1980s finishes okay well uh, all right you might want to consider not doing that corridor mm -hmm. because whoever's going to come in and take that full floor if that's what you want you just let them you, you blend it into their build out and you save some money on that all right and then the second question I have if I'm allowed to ask more there from my uh, esteemed colleagues and did you consider spec spaces uh, that might save you some money on TI. You know, yeah, thirty-five dollars to try and do a TI. Yeah, yeah, I can go ahead and take that one. Um, in, the ter in terms of speculative space, uh, we kind of fought back and forth with the white boxing of the fourth floor. Um, it's difficult right now because the current tenant profile is a mix of uh, larger tenants and smaller suites within one floor. Um, so if we were going to do a spec space, we would have to restack the building, and that's something that we considered. But we decided that a fourth floor white box would be more viable if we got a larger tenant to come in there. It's just difficult with the different amount, with the number of suites on one different floor. Got it. But you did consider it. So yeah, that was part of the consideration. In your financial performance, where's the repayment of the debt? The repayment of the debt is uh, actually blended in with the existing current financials that we were given. So while it says it's uh, levered IR at the bottom, it's sort of a, uh, a blended um, rate down there. And uh, once we finalize with ownership how much uh, debt they, additional debt they would like to take on, that's when we would come in with a full uh, debt plan. There was a mention of a $100,000 line of credit. I didn't understand what that was to be used for. Take that one to you. It was a five hundred thousand uh, dollar revolving line of credit, and that was for the uh, capital expenditures. And then we would offer the possibility of uh, extending that line of credit further to help relieve some of the financial burdens of the new tenant improvements, as well as the new leasing commissions associated with the uh, high leasing activity in the next couple of years. Thank you. Uh, the, the signage rights, if there's no lease in place for the fourth floor, which is you're going to white box that, then why is there signage rights tied to the fourth floor? Right, yeah, I can that. go ahead and take yeah. that one. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting issue that we ran into. So with the fourth floor lease, it's tied in that whoever rents that fourth floor gets the signage rights to the building. And that was one of the weird things that we came across because it doesn't really make sense if there's no current tenant, why we'd be tied into the lease. So that's one of the things that we looked at as a potential additional increase in revenue. It just didn't really make sense with the information that we were given. And that's why we considered it because it'd just be additional revenue that we wouldn't necessarily have to do anything for. Okay, good. Great job. Ladies and gentlemen of the Institute of Real Estate Management, my name is Caleb Myers, and I am joined here by my team, Megan, Jacob, Vivek, and Charles. So we are here today to tell you about a brand new repositioning plan that is sure to increase your tenant occupancy for the target property to over 95% within one year. Now I know what you're thinking. The last thing I want to do is to keep you waiting to hear about this incredible new strategy. So with that being said, please allow me to toss the baton off to my teammate and personal friend Charles, who's gonna tell us about the property and the financials. Good morning. So today we're gonna to talk about Glen Lakes Medical Plaza, which is 9900 North Central Expressway in Dallas. So as you can see here, the building is 160 feet by 65 feet with a five-story uh, main building. There's a second additional building that's behind it for one story that's 30 by 60. 
There are 118 parking spaces on the surface and then in a, in a three story subterranean garage. The property has 140 feet of frontage to Central Expressway, which gives us easy, quick access to the highway. Also, you can see in this picture here that it is zoned GOA, which is just general office, which gives us a wide range of what we can do with this property. It is also conveniently located to Presbyterian and Medical City Hospitals. It is just down the street from the Walnut Hill uh, Light Rail Station. And there are also multiple bus lines that allow us wide range of access for both tenants and customers of those tenants. Just a quick overview of the building. It was built in 1982. It's a rectangular building with a brick and metal framed glass windows. It is approximately 0.9 acres. Each floor has a central lobby where the elevator well is and then a hallway that leads to all the offices. There is approximately 53,000 square feet total in the building with current lease of just over 32,000 by 11 tenants. In 2014, they started renovating the building. Approximately $62,000 was spent to remodel the second and the fifth floor, which is paint, carpet, and lighting. $117,000 was spent to restripe the garage and renovate it. $300,000 was spent to renovate the uh, restrooms on the second through the fifth floors. And then in 2015, they spent $25,000 to replace three old HVAC units, $7,000 to repair the leaky roof, roof hatch, and just over $10,000 to replace three water heaters. As you can see here, total revenue is just under $700,000 with total expenses of just under 440, leaving us with an NOI of 255,000. Current average rent uh, gross per square foot is 11.98. That includes the entire building averaged out for the 11 tenants. So we have plenty of room to grow with our rent. Based on an 8.57 cap rate, the building is approximately $3 million. Going through the budget, we saw several large variances that were over budget. Here you can see the HVAC r &M was 263% over budget. We feel this could be reduced by replacing the remaining HVAC units. The elevator contract and elevator repair and maintenance variances were 38% and 74% over budget respectively. We feel this can be re uh, lowered by renegotiating the contract and moving elevator maintenance to top priority. We also have 170% over budget on plumbing. We need to have a plumber come in and investigate this cause and get that fixed. General supplies and equipment is 350% over budget. We just need to review the contract and any shopping uh, that our building does and just control our supplies better within the building. General building repair and maintenance was 122% over budget. This just needs to be controlled. There, uh, it's just too high. So addressing these five items that were over budget, if we just get them down to where they were budget, we will save an additional $50,000 annually to compare to what was uh, budgeted. And now I'll pass it off to Megan to handle this part. Thank you, Charles. So today I would like to elaborate further on our market demand. So the Dallas Fort Worth metropolitan area encompasses 13 counties. According to the Dallas Chamber's reports, in, the, uh, in 2018, DFW area, we had 7.58 million people in population, which represents an average annual 2% increase, uh, in uh, uh, increase in the last 10 years. And also, in the next following five years, the DFW area population is projected to increase at 1.9 percent, which the, eventually in the 2023, the population will reach to the 8.2 million people. I estimate 35 percent of DFW area residents uh, are co college graduates with four years degree or higher. And also the median household income is $46,460 in 2008. According to the United States Census Bureau reports, so uh, since uh, 2009, the employment rate increased 26.5% over the entire period. 
Based on gross domestic products, the DFW area is the fourth largest metropolitan area economy in the entire uh, nation. And also, we have expanded 3.3% uh, average annual rate over the last uh, nine years. Based on above information, we projected that the DFW area economy will continue on the upward trend economically and also that will support and strengthen our demand for the real estate market. And right now, I want to pass to my, um, to my friend Caleb to give you more information regarding the market supply. Thank you, Megan. So to talk a little bit more on the market supply, which is perfectly reflected in the demand, to start us off, we have a net rentable square footage in the DFW area of roughly 214 million square feet, with a vacancy rate of around 19.6% and an average price per square foot of about $24.48. So I'd like to direct your attention now to this graph up here. Um, it covers information based on roughly the last 10 years, but mainly I'd like to speak on the jump from 2017 to 2018. Um, specifically, the net occupiable space has gone down in the DFW area by about two and a half million, and the net absorption rate has also decreased by roughly three and a half million as well. Um, however, while the market may be appearing to soften a little bit, um, we have seen a demand for different doctoral type positions, such as primary care physicians uh, and OBGYNs in the area, which is perfect because we actually don't have an OBGYN position right now as a tenant, so that position will be easy to fill. So if we take a look, here is a bird's eye view of the target property itself with a few of these surrounding properties just to kind of get a little feel for what they look like. Here is some more information regarding the properties themselves. As you can see, we are the cheapest rent um, in the area. We are one of the oldest as well, but the cheapest nonetheless. And like I touched upon in the past few slides, um, Class B office buildings have been increasing in vacancy rates while decreasing in overall net absorption rates. Um, while at first glance this may seem like a negative, um, we plan to strengthen our position in the market by making sure to maintain these minimal rents compared to our competition while also providing small upgrades to our property, both small and large, to make sure that we're competitive in the market. And that is something that Vivek is going to be touching on a little later, but for now I'd like to go ahead and pass the baton off to Jacob. Thank you very much, Caleb. So we're going to cover some of the issues and concerns that we currently have with the property. The main concern that we have that has actually diminished the ability for us to lease our spaces is a limited parking space requirement by the City of Houston for zoning requirements. The other one that we have an issue with is the functional obsolescence of the building. Some of the architecture is a little bit out designed for the updates inside and we're going to address that in a little bit with the VEX plan. Our plan is going to be reducing the parking required by the city. Um, using four certificates of occupancy, as well as updating the aesthetic of the building so that we can capture that rent. For that, we're gonna consider one option, which is gonna be the lease space from the hill, which is our back door neighbor. Um, so our subject property is gonna be up top. We do have the rental parking down below. I have spoken to Brittany from the hill, who did mention that currently they're not leasing spaces due to a limited space of their own property. Um, however, with using the um, plan that we'll talk about in just a minute, they'll actually be able to gain 375 spaces of their own property as well that they would be able to lease out. So um, they will be capturing the same concept that we'll be using for our property. With this, we'd be leasing 42 spaces from them in this back lot area, and we'll offer a courtesy cart shuttle um, via a golf cart from this parking to the main entrance, um, just to keep the safety and liability down. With this plan, we would expect just over $5,000 a month in lease rent fees for the spaces, and then $2,130 per month for the shuttle service with renting the golf cart and the hourly wages of the employee, which would cost $76,040 annually. Due to the high cost of this one, that would be a recurring cost. We do not advise this one currently, but we do think it would be very valuable as we start to lease up our spaces to provide tenant space later on. We can rent less spaces around the 20 um, space mark, and that would very much help us with being able to negotiate our contracts to include parking. One of the other options we would have is to actually build a parking lot nearby. This lot 17 up here in the top corner is uh, located very close to our subject property and is currently zoned as the only parking structure in the area. So it is currently zoned for parking but is currently not used for anything. We could purchase that um, lot 
add a um, parking lot on top of it while saving the trees for a small reduction as well. We like our parking reductions in this company. Um, for that, we would expect to have a $350,000 budget for the construction and the purchase, and then $2,130 in the courtesy shuttle. So the only thing you'd have to expend annually is the $25,560 for the shuttle itself. But again, with the high capital cost going into this, we do not recommend it as of now, but it could be an option down the road as well. The one we do favor is going to be the administrative reduction for train access, and this is provided in the City of Dallas very exciting code of parking regulations, thanks to Section 51A 4.313, which is the administrative reduction for public access. Um, and we are currently located extremely close to the light rail station that we mentioned previously. With that proximity, we would be able to get up to 20% reduction in our parking requirement. Currently, we are needing 160 for full occupancy. This would actually reduce it by 32 spaces. So without any expenditure that we would need other than filing with the city for an administrative reduction, we would save immediately and be able to start leasing to tenants. This one would also, um, we would be offering a shuttle for 28,800 annually or getting a service for 2,400 a month, which would also cover all the liability, wages, and the expense of renting the shuttle. We do want to offer this to provide the safety, welfare, and health of our tenants um, because we are a little further than we would like to be from the rail station, just over the 1,200 feet mark, as well as not having a um, wide enough um, walkway. So instead, we would like to protect our tenants and residents and give them an access to the property extremely easily. The other one that we would like to pre uh, present is the bicycle parking reduction, also under the same code. It is 51A 4.314, and this one allows you to reduce 5% of your parking requirement through the city um, for offering parking spaces or bicycle parking spaces. Um, with this, you are able to equivalent six uh, common use class, a, uh, class one parking spaces for one uh, regular car parking space and then four spaces of bicycle parking under class two would actually save one more parking space. So this we would actually be able to save 5% by installing three class two racks and one class one rack, which is 30 secured and issuable to tenants, which would also compensate for not having enough parking, and then one rack for common use, which is also required in the code. Um, this would save us eight spaces, bringing us a total of 40, save, 40 spaces saved using reductions that would have no upfront cost except this one, where we would build a fenced enclosure in the parking garage for the class two racks. The reason we have selected using the parking garage is currently there is an easement on our property for the power line. Um, where the power line runs, we are required to provide five and a half feet on each side of the power line, which would take up the main space that is on the surface area which would be the best location for it. So instead, we'll uh, house these in the parking garage with signs directing access to them. And we would have the 30 secured units within the fenced area, and then we would also have the other uh, common use one on the front, fr front property. This would cost $15,466, but would have a minimal maintenance fee of just upkeeping of the fenced area. Now we're gonna go ahead and pass it off to Vivek and hear about what our recommendation for the property is. Thank you, Jacob. So uh, now it's gonna be the recommendation and also financials and the numbers behind it. Uh, so our recommendation uh, is basically, we're gonna start off by telling you the problems, recapping the goals of ownership and tenants, et cetera. Then we're gonna tell you what the actual plan is, go into the nitty gritty in terms of the budget. And then finally, we're gonna give you a timeline for our proposal. So again, recapping the problem, right now the property only has 118 parking spaces. According to the Dallas uh, City Code, we need 160 parking spaces. And then obviously the goal is just to increase the net revenue. In terms of the course of action, the first thing we're going to do is install the bike racks. This is because before we we're able to file for the administrative access or the administrative reductions, we actually have to have those in place. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to pursue the bike rack reduction as well as the train access reductions at the same time. That's our second step. The third step is going to be the capital upgrades. We're going to upgrade the uh, floors three and four all together, and then we're going to repaint floors one, two, and five. We're going to conduct a comprehensive air test on the building, and finally, just to make the building more hospitable, we're going to place benches, art, and plants. Uh, we're going to implement a new leasing strategy, which I'm going to be talking about in a couple slides, and uh, finally, obviously, the good stuff, which is going to be signing leases and earning about $425,000 approximately in gross rent.
So here are some of the interior upgrades we're going to be doing. Uh, obviously, you see the uh, paint swatch there. We're going to be painting um, the uh, hallways a light gray color. Uh, we're going to be placing benches on all five of the floors. And then we're going to be recarpeting two of the floors to match the other three floors. So in terms of art installation, just because uh, we want to kind of engage the community in the restoration of uh, this building, we're going to be doing a local high school art contest. We're going to be providing $300 scholarships for every two pieces of art a student submits if it's accepted. Um, every year, this is technically a recurring cost because every year we'd like to be able to give the students their art pieces back and kind of cycle a new uh, you know, art into the building. Uh, in terms of the numbers, just really quickly, uh, there'll be 10 pieces of total art among all five floors, so it's only going to be about two pieces of art, still making the building slightly more hospitable. So there are a few risks that we, uh, I guess, uh, we identified. The first is going to be projections on when leases are actually signed. Obviously, we don't have a fortune ball, so we, we don't really know exactly the date of when leases are signed. We believe our estimates are conservative, but at the same time, well-balanced to project you know, some type of optimism with our plan. Uh, at the same time, potential costs could be higher than the actual budget. Um, in order to kind of mitigate this risk, we've definitely taken steps to get bids, also be conservative our numbers, and make sure we're not cutting any corners here. And finally, there's just the overkill risk. Are we doing too much to get tenants back in? Uh, in this aspect, we take the position that we'd rather be safe than sorry. With that said, in terms of financing, we're going to do capital contributions that we're going to first go through the SBA, the Small Business Administration, to pursue these mortgages. Uh, if it doesn't work out there, if we're not getting the rates we want there, or if for some reason our financing doesn't happen there, uh, we're going to be using other you know, uh, mortgage lenders such as Plains Capital Bank, Texas Citizens Bank, etc. In terms of the actual, I guess, terms of the agreement, we're pursuing 5.5% loan at 25 years of uh, amortization on a five-year balloon payment. Um, TL, TI allowance, as well as just the capital contributions altogether, will be 75% loan to value. So we're going to be putting 25% of that down um, per this plan commencing. So the leasing plan we think is quite simple actually. Right now we all know this uh, building is in a dire situation in terms of cash flow. We have to do something right now to make sure that we get new tenants in to basically increase the cash flow. And what we're going to do is the asking price right now is $22. We're going to accept $18 for the first wave of a new tenant. So right now the building is approximately 60 or 61% occupied. Once from 61 to 75% we'll be doing deals at $18 per square foot. Okay, and then from 75 to 85% occupancy, we'll be doing deals at 20. And finally, when we stabilize the building to a point where we feel comfortable with the cash flow, the last 15%, we're going to be do doing deals at $22 a square foot. To clarify, these are all gross numbers. The other two aspects of uh, each of our plans is going to be that they all have 2% annual bumps and then four months of free rent. Now, just to clarify, we're not offering that off, you know, off the bat. It's just our way of basically negotiating that lease if it comes to that point. The other idea we have is once we actually do the capital upgrades, we clean up the building, we make sure that it's it's really tenant friendly, we're going to do a broker open house. Now, although this isn't very much used in commercial real estate, we believe having all the brokers who are even the slightest bit interested of just knowing what the building is will create new leads and prospects which will allow us to sign leases quicker. So our target market is just going to stick to medical office tenants. These include people like OBGYN, as we already mentioned before, the t uh, building doesn't currently have one, dialysis, research, primary care physicians, and etc. So here's just the high level overview of the budget. Um, 426000 is the cost of tenant improvement, 132000 is the are the building expenses. Uh, i just like to make a clarifying point here. The 426000 is going to be spent regardless of our, you know, of our proposal being accepted or not. Tenant improvement will always be part of the equation. So really, the main part of the equation we'd like you to focus on is $132,000. That's really the building expenses we're putting in through our plan um, to make this a more rentable building. So here's the actual budget breakdown. The three main costs are going to be tenant improvement, the carpet, lighting, and paint, so basically a full redo of floors three and four, and then finally the shuttle service. As you can see, tenant improvement clearly uh, the bulk or the majority of the cost. The total cost is $558,000. Now here's where I think, you know, this is my favorite part of the presentation. So this talks about the current versus pro forma NOI. So I'm kind of a numbers guy. So right now we're only doing 255,000, and after debt service, et cetera, he's barely clearing 45,000. Uh, and that's going to be your cash flow. Pro forma 2020, so this is if you annualize the rents after we bring in tenants and then you don't include rent abatements, uh, the NOI of the building will increase to $511,000, which means a net gain of $256,000. And in terms of cash flow, your, uh, your cash flow is also going up by $300,000 to $348,000. 
Uh, just a few clarifying points here. The first being, uh, the way we got to these numbers, obviously we're adding up the net rents to the net revenue, and then also we're subtracting the 25% we put down for the capital contributions on the 532,000 total amount, and then we're also including the interest and principal payments on that loan that we're gonna do for the first year. So with that being said, uh, here's a quick timeline of where we you know, project our plan to go through. So March 1st, so today, if you accept the plan, we're ready to put it into action. We're gonna commence the capital improvements and we're also going to begin the process of filing, filling out the paperwork, making sure we comply with whatever the rules of uh, you know, Dallas City are, et cetera. April 1st, which is one month from now, we're going to release a new marketing brochure. Throughout the span of April, not necessarily the first day, uh, but throughout the span of April, we're going to conduct the broker open house once the capital upgrades uh, have been made. We project that by August 1st, we're able to bring at least the first tranche of tenants in. So somewhere along that line, we average out by January 1st, 2020, including the free rent, that's when we're gonna have full cash flow coming in. Even if you take, give or, you know, give or take a few months on this number, with the cash flow we're projecting, it's clear that our plan, our proposal is the most efficacious at what we're trying to solve, which is increasing the net revenue. But with that said, I'd like to hand it back to Caleb, who's gonna wrap it all up for us. Thank you, Vivek. So to go ahead and wrap this up, because we did have so much information that we told you about today, and to do it very quickly, because I think we're approaching on time, um, there's a few main things that I'd just like to go ahead and clarify one more time. So to start us off, um, compared to our competitors and the amount that we're spending, we are definitely getting the most bang for our buck, um, as you could have seen from our um, financials near the end there. Um, also, um, our plan is going to be very time efficient, which we're hoping, like he said, in the next year, uh, we're going to be producing 100% of the projected returns for this project. So with that said, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Um, we've had a great time preparing this presentation and we feel that our project is going to be the best possible solution for this building and we hope you all feel the same. Uh, again, thank you so much and please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. to reduce parking requirements yes. for proximity to DART and also for the biking uh, components. What does that get your parking requirements to? So that would actually be for full occupancy. What would be if we were doing the three to one parking ratio? That would actually provide for 100% occupancy. And so quick follow up. What's the proximity to residential components for the biking? How far away do they <laughs> so there's um, housing right on the other side of the highway and a lot of um, apartment complexes um, are going to be in each of the corners so right on the other side of the highway and then down the road in each direction there's going to be major apartment complexes with hundreds of tenants in those and can I also add that additional with the light rail people can ride their bike to the light rail take the train down and then ride that last remaining bit so we feel that there's a wide range of people that will be able to access the building. Thank you. Can you clarify the difference between a class one and class two bike rack? Absolutely. So class two bike racks um, are gonna be a secured location. So you have to provide either a tenant or some form of locking mechanism where you can actually keep the bike safe. Um, with that, we would be adding the um, fenced enclosure with the automated locks in it with the uh, gate code access. And those would be provided to the tenants for their employees use. And then per the regulation as well, we would have to provide public access spaces, which is why you have the class one rack installed as well. Um, with that, for every 10 class two that are gonna be private, you have to offer two to the public, which is where we're getting the six and the 30. Yes, sir. Uh, the air test, what are you testing? Why are you testing that? Yeah. Okay, so when we've toured the property on several occasions, we noticed that it was a, a slight stale um, scent to it. So we just <laughs> so we just wanted to ensure that there is no further issues. And if there were, we're uh, planning to either do HVAC repairs or do any mold mitigation that was needed. Um, we're optimistically hoping that there are no concerns, considering we are occupied, but we're ready to um, handle that if needed. So what if it is worst, worst case? Are you going to, did you budget some money for mold remediation? Uh, what is necessary? Okay, all right, I will do that. Um, hmm. Did you consider that the, the huge variance in the RNM, yeah, if it was caused uh, for overspending or just bad budgeting? Uh, we believe it's a little bit of both, actually. 
<clears throat> um, the main concern of that is the age of the building and that it has been upkept. So going through and replacing some of the systems, like the, the remaining HVAC and the plumbing, will bring that down. Uh, as far as the actual cause, we won't really know until we are able to get in there and investigate it. Okay. And then uh, an the additional part to that uh, air test, none of the hallways have any open ventilation space in the building. That will be one of the things that we remediate with the air quality test and also renovating the remaining air systems to, to allow some ducting into the uh, hallway. Uh, yeah, I don't want you to get too technical. I don't even know if you did, but what kind of uh, system do they have? Uh, it, uh, we didn't actually get a chance to look that deep into it, but it appears to be a mix of chillers and uh, air conditioning. I like the, the art plan, by the way. Oh, I Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we like that one too. Yeah. Uh, Kristen said, uh, and I think you did, uh, the building next to you, uh, you were going to rent spaces from them yes, when sir. you needed them. Yes, sir. So not, not right away because at a 50% occupancy, you really don't need them yet, but enable to, to do your leases. You Absolutely. Can. So one option, uh, one option for full occupancy is to lease the 42 spaces, but with a high significance, we think that's not the best plan. The best plan would be to uh, pursue the parking reductions with the city first. And then as a means of adding spaces for the tenants, as we start to lease up and we are wanting to negotiate into the contracts that they have tenant spaces, then you can actually pursue leasing next door, but that wouldn't be your first step. Did you, did you check with them to make sure that- Yes, so I spoke with Brittany, um, who's the leasing agent there, and she said currently they're not leasing spaces because they need those. However, they haven't pursued the parking reduction themselves for being next to the train. They weren't aware of it. So when we brought that to their attention, they would actually be able to save 370 five parking spaces from where they were which would allow them to rent out their spaces to us at even 20 spaces I got one more please let me ask you. So when you drop down you drop that rental rate down to 18 so you've gone and, and market is what so right now what you have to understand according to that chart was the other buildings who had higher prices were all class a medical spaces okay in terms of medical only the office those are the medical offices in the area were the cheapest for a class b building it also seems that they have a lot more amenities such as like gym cafeteria etc than we do so that's kind of why we're the lowest office right now okay but so you're going to drop them down to 18 you're going to start out your new leasing program at 18 a foot and i think you said it's going to run for uh two years three years and so those tenants that are, are now edged up to about twenty dollars a square foot and now your market's 27 a foot your your market what's the impact going to be when you're going to try to get that guy up to market or are you just going to keep easing him up little by little so what we're doing with these aggressive lease rates is when we when we do the lease we're giving them aggressive lease rates to kind of get them in we're also doing two percent annual bumps on them for every single year and the other thing is their options are going to reflect either fair market value of the time or they're definitely going to reflect a high increase, maybe 3% bumps per year on a $20 starting rate or something like that. So we're being aggressive to get them in because cash flow is being lost right now. We'd rather lose $2 per square foot in the first you know, year or so than to lose all the you know, tenant revenue altogether. Yeah. And, and on that as well, the past two leases that we did lease that were back in 2014 were just under that as well. So they were around the $17 mark. Okay. So we're actually edging up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Logan Gregory. I'm Renee Looney. Mauricio Robles. Quentin Pashota. I'm Nicholas Williams. And I'm Jason Hurd. We are Eagle Consulting. Let me start off by saying thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation on Glen Lakes Health Plaza located at 9900 North Central Expressway in Dallas, Texas. Running through the table of contents, just to give you a brief overflow of how our presentation will go. We'll start off with analyzing the site and property, showing the current financial of the property, doing a market analysis of the area, showing you some of our ideas we thought of with our analysis of alternatives, uh, go over the demographics in the area, show you our marketing plan for what we chose to do with the property, and then ultimately our proposal. Starting with the site. Up on the screen is a survey of the property that we received from the City of Dallas Building Department. When you look at the survey, you can see that the property is approximately 0.91 acres in size. It's a rectangle. It's right off of Highway 75 and Glen Lakes Drive. Upon our site visit to the property, we saw that the project slopes slightly gradually to the right, excuse me, to the east. 
Located just 0.3 miles away from the property, a five minute walk is a dart station located at Walnut Hill Station. Right outside the front door to the property, where you see that star on the map, is a dart bus that'll take you straight to the dart station. Up on the screen here are some photos that we took during our, our site visit. So the property is five stories, approximately 50,000 square feet. It is a brown brick clad. It has aluminum storefront windows that are tinted that run from the first floor to the fifth floor and line the perimeter of the entire building. Beneath the building is a three-story subterranean parking garage. The structure of the building is cast in place reinforced concrete, structural columns, and cast in place concrete at each floor level. <coughs> at the front of the building is minimal landscape, which we think just meets Dallas city code. Though our property is a class B, we consider it to be in poor condition for some of the reasons that the pictures portray on the screen. There's damage to the exterior. This photo right here is in the parking garage, so there appears to be some water damage there. And we could do a better job on maintaining the outside um, entrance to the parking garage. That might be a little off-putting to some tenants and their visitors. Um, inside, we have interior damage on the walls. Another little something that might be a bit off-putting is the fact that the first unit you see when you walk in is apparently being used for storage. We feel that could be utilized in a much better way. And big issue here, I know I'm speaking to property managers, there's water leaking in the inside of the building, so we know the implications that come with water damage. But here's our biggest problem and the reason why we are not able to reach an occupancy of 95% we don't have enough parking. I visited the Dallas City Municipal Center and obtained the certificates of occupancy for each unit. The important thing with that is that it designated the land use for each specific unit, which means that they have different parking requirements. For each unit designated as medical use, you need one space per 200 square feet. For each unit designated as general office, you need one space per 333 square feet. So we were able to do our parking analysis from that. We currently don't meet the required parking ratio for the designated uses. We need 146 spaces. We currently have only 118. Over here, it shows that if every vacant unit was designated as general office use, we would still need 55 additional spots, which leaves us with a total deficit of 82 parking spots. We feel there's not enough space on the land to pave that. So, because we can't get leased up due to the parking situation, we're not in very good financial situation. Here's an example of one of the certificates of occupancy that I obtained. The rent roll that was provided to us in the case study did not include Senative Health, but we saw upon our visit to the property that they are in Suite 555. The certificate of occupancy verified their land use and their square footage, and we made the assumption on the rent roll that they were renting at $22 a square foot. Notice we also accounted for two tenants leaving before the end of the year, which you can see in our rent revenue for 2019, which is why it shows a greater net operating loss than the year before. Now, even though we're in a fairly poor financial situation, we do believe that the property could be sold for more than the Dallas Central Appraisal District currently has the property valued at, which is 1.8 million. I took three comparables given to me by a CoStar report within a 10 mile radius and compared them to the subject. I adjusted them for vacancy and for square footage. Then I took the average adjusted price per square foot and applied it to our subject square footage to get an assumed value of over four and a half million dollars, which we do believe that the property could be sold for. 
All right, so we know that we have two problems. The first one is parking. The other one is that we have low vacancy. We have a high vacancy rate. So before we made any uh, suggestions on how to fix these problems, we wanted to do like a really good market research to know what everybody, everybody else is doing, to know what the market is doing right now, to know what it has done in the past, and also to um, get an estimate to what the market will be doing in the future. So, the first thing that we found out after doing a full underwriting CoStar report, we found out that the average gross asking rent is $24.86. That is almost $4 higher than what we're asking because on average right now on LoopNet, we are asking $21 per square foot. And this is all for class B office space. So, this graph is for the Dallas Fort Worth area, and it shows that in 2013 there was an 18% vacancy rate, and it is forecast to be at 12% right now. So, what what I'm getting from this is basically that those people who got into contracts in 2013 are going to be looking for new office space. Uh, pretty soon. So now that they're looking for space, they're not going to be able to afford the premium $24, $25 that everybody else is asking. So they are gonna come to our building and they're going to, because they're, they would rather pay $21 instead of 26. So moving on to this graph, this one is specific for the Central Expressway area. And what we can see from here is that there has been a lot of deliveries and it is expected to grow and our vacancy rate will be lower than the Dallas Forward area by like 3%. So that means that there will be a high demand for class B office space in this area and they're going to come to our building because we have the lower rates. And just to let you know how high the demand is in this area, right now they are building three properties within a one mile radius and that and 67 percent of that office space has already been pre-leased and these properties will not be delivered until 2020 and this is all from the costa report so just to give you like a recap from our market research there is a high demand there is a lot of deliveries coming in the following years and people are looking for class b office space because they don't want to pay the premiums that everybody else is charging So before we talk about our final proposal, we're going to talk about some of the alternatives we considered. <clears throat> one of them was to build a new parking garage, and then after that we considered demolishing the building and constructing a new one. And then we also considered remodeling the existing building for other uses. After speaking with the zoning department, we got this document and eventually chose to use an adult daycare facility. This is what we found out would give us the best return from all of the things we've looked into. The demographics is what we're going to use to back up the use for an adult daycare. This map shows our subject property as the star in the center. The rings around are 3 miles, 5 miles, and 10 miles. Again, our subject property is the star, and all of these pins are other adult daycare facilities in the DFW. As you can see, there's a giant void in the center. That's where we want to be. In 2019, our population was around 1.4 million people in a 10 mile radius. We have 74% of our occupation currently in white collar positions. Maybe even our tenants will be using our facility. We have 37% of our population making over $100,000 in three miles. This is a very affluent area. In that same three miles, we can see 15% still make over $250,000. In three miles, we have two-thirds of our popul population owning a home that's valued over $300,000. Very expensive homes. Age, in our opinion, is the most interesting. Since we're using to do an adult daycare, we wanted to know what, how many older people are, are part of our community. Within three miles, we see that a quarter of our population are over the age of 55. In that same three miles, 14% are over the age of 65. 65 stands out to me because the National Alzheimer's Association says that the greatest known risk factor is increasing age and the majority of people with Alzheimer's are 65 and over. So now we know what we're going to do. How are we going to get there? We shopped the market and eventually found a suitable tenant. 
Encore specializes in memory care. Alzheimer's memory care, you get it. We eventually contacted them and we got information that they would be willing to pay $26 a square foot. This is just a sample brochure of what they would use to sell the building, to advertise, market, things like that. All right, and uh, some of their ideal rates here. Uh, it starts at $90 a day for individuals who can kind of get around mostly on their own, just need a little bit of supervision, and it goes up from there the more assistance they need. And we've also included a special event and evening rate, which is a slightly higher rate. Uh, from there, a couple of quick wins we found right away that would really make us pop immediately against the competition. Is first to just clean up the area facing 75. You know, there's a little bit of trash there. The dumpster's on that side. And then our leasing sign that's got a little age on it, starting to lean. That's an easy fix. It'll make us look good. Also, on our loop net listing, you can tell it's been there for a while. The pictures are a little bit grainy. If we could just freshen it up, really make it pop and stand out on loop net. And then from there, once we start fixing up some of our current issues, we'll be able to get it back onto the Lincoln Harris website where it's not even listed right now. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. All right, so we've heard about some issues with the property. We've heard about our solution with the adult memory daycare facility. Now let's talk about our course of action and how we're gonna get there. So let me just preface by saying that we're gonna keep this building as medical office use, but we just wanna designate the fourth floor to Encore's adult daycare facility. That's going to include construction costs. We created a conceptual plan for the fourth floor. We went out to a real general contractor in the DFW area known as Parkway Construction and got a proposed construction number for what it would take to actually refinish the fourth floor. This following slide here shows a conceptual plan that we created that we think would be indicative of what Encore's adult daycare facility would really want. Having things such as a member lounge where we can set up tables, the guests can come and watch movies. We have a library in the back here for quiet time, an auditorium where there can maybe be karaoke, dancing, things like that, an exercise studio right next to the windows looking over 75, locker rooms here in the middle, an office area where Encore can actually operate their business. And right up here in the front, outside of the elevators would be the member relations area where new tenants could come, sign up, learn about the facility and what's offered there. On the right side of your screen, is a breakdown of the estimate that it would cost to actually redo the fourth floor to make this facility work. Starting at the top, you see interior demolition, which includes an abatement cost, which we think would most likely be absolutely necessary being as this building was built in 1981. You see that we're gonna move around some walls. We're gonna redo some structural framing. These red lines indicate where those walls will be moved and the space will be opened up. Then we'll refinish with new flooring, new paint, new ceilings. That number came in just approximately over $200,000. So we took that number and we got an $8.44 per square foot cost, which actually just includes flooring, painting, and new ceilings to, re to renovate the remaining 12,000 square feet that's currently vacant in the facility. <coughs> this includes the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, and the fifth. Using this number, we plan on doing tenant improvements on those particular spaces so that we can invite other tenants to come in and just use it as office space, correct? So this number would come out to just under $315,000 for interior construction costs. But seeing as parking was such an issue with this property, we didn't want to just glance over that. So we came up with an idea to add 14 parking spaces at the front of the building. These spaces are gonna be right off of Glen Lakes Drive, just a short walk to the entrance of the building. We assume that we can rent out these spaces for revenue, $65 a month as a reserved parking for future tenants to come in, being, being as the short walk to the front here. Also, we included a drop-off lane, which we think will be absolutely crucial, crucial for that fourth floor use with the adult daycare facility and the demographic that we're marketing to. Included in the construction estimate for these costs was $43,000 to do all of this dirt work and new paving. So that brings our number to just about $360,000 for interior and exterior construction costs. My colleague Jason is going to talk about how we consume these financials in some of the following slides. 
To further our solution for parking, I also reached out to Bobby Rieger at the Municipal Center and he said it was very likely that we could get a parking variance because of our new land use for the fourth floor. <coughs> and the property manager for the property adjacent on the south side of us, right next door, we reached out to her and they may be willing to lease over, what, 30 spots mm -hmm. to us? Now we come to the part of the presentation that's my favorite when talking about any good deal. How are we going to finance it and are we really going to be making more money from it? Now the original plan was to rate shop around at different banks and institutions to see who would offer us a better rate on our proposal. That was until my colleague Nate Williams here did a little more research on the property and found us the deed of trust. <coughs> In it, we believe our property is one of 20 rolled up into a REIT. That's a real estate investment trust portfolio. All of these are medical offices in the state of Texas. Now, Capital One originated a loan back in December of 2015 for $407 million for these properties with a max aggregate loan amount of $421 million. That will come into effect later on. Now, Capital One not only has the first lien deed of trust on the property, they also have the first lien deed of trust on the assignments of rents and lease. Because of that, we knew we could not go out to other institutions to get a loan. No bank would give a second lien loan, so we had to keep the loan in-house. Furthermore, as you see here under maintenance and security, Capital One states that no improvements, remodeling, or demolition can happen to the building without the consent of Capital One. Now, because of how poorly the property is performing, we believe Capital One would go ahead and approve our proposal for a better cash flowing entity. Now, how many of you could go out into a bank market today in this rising rate market and get a loan for 4%? We believe we would be able to do so through right of option as seen here in section 8.11 of future advances. In it, Capital One states that they would loan up to that max aggregate loan amount of $421 million and the advance would take on the same loan terms as if the advance was done on the date of execution back in December of 2015. Now I'm sure you're wondering where is this guy getting 4% from? On my experience as being a commercial underwriter for commercial lending, the Wall Street Journal Prime is a primary pricing structure for most loans. We added on a half percent just for risk of rate and return and we were able to get a 4% loan. With that, we were able to roll into our loan amount. We added on our additional construction costs and found that we're only going to be adding on an additional 20,000 interest expense per year. That's less than 2,000 a month. With that, we were able to roll into our pro forma. Now, as we talked about earlier, Encore would be taking over our fourth floor, taking our occupancy from 50% to 70% just by the year 2020. As Mauricio talked about earlier, we're expecting a 12.5% decrease in vacancy to reach our objective 95% occupancy by the year 2022. We may hit that sooner because of the demand for it. Down towards the bottom of the pro forma, you can see that we're estimated our cash flow that we're expecting to get from the properties. We're expecting to double our cash flow in two years. Over on the right hand side, I've done a basic loan covenant structure that most banks require of their borrowers. This is a 1.25 to 1.3 debt service coverage. I've done this on an interest only basis as well as an amortizing basis and we still meet those covenants. Now back over at the pro forma, you can see I've taken out depreciation from the pro forma. The reason why is property owners are intentionally adding back in depreciation to devalue their property. The reason behind this, as seen in this article in the Dallas Morning News, to gauge a REIT's actual property value, you have to take out depreciation. Depreciation in REIT, one, acts as a tax shield. Second, if property owners have a negative NOI, they do not have to pay shareholders and investors their stake. That keeps more of the cash in-house. The other thing that I've done is I've done a loan-to-value property analysis as well as a cap rate property analysis. By taking our cap rate analysis in CoStar, we found a 6.6% cap rate. We take our cash flow, divide it by 6.6% cap rate to get our property value, and we are expecting to increase our property value by $2.8 million. So kind of the recap everything we've gone over today, we started off with a medical office building in Dallas that had an occupancy problem because it could not meet the city of Dallas requirements for parking. We solved the parking issue by adding additional parking to the front of the building, leasing out parking spaces to the adjacent property next door, and getting a special provision from the city of Dallas. Once we solved our parking issue, we will able to increase our occupancy by getting a letter of intent from Encore and by renovating the interior of the building to make it more appealing to tenants. On behalf of all of us at Equal Consulting, we'd like to say thank you for your time. Thank you.
to open the floor up to any questions that you may have at this moment. Did you check on state licensing requirements for adult daycare? And is it going to require any additional improvements to the buildings? We talked about the. We talked with Encore. Uh, we kind of gave them the layout of our plan, and they, they seemed interested in it, and uh, they didn't see any problems that presented for them to be having any concern not to operate them. So if I can answer that question, based off of state licensing and things of that nature, seeing as it's not going to be an overnight facility, it's just a, it's just a daytime facility. We, we worked under the assumption that the current layout, the bathrooms, um, things like that were actually going to be okay for the facility, seeing as it wasn't an overnight. An overnight stay. And the city did, it is under the current zoning for the land. It was a specialized use within the medical office, office use after we did research. So I, I, I thought it was a very creative uh, solution. I, I, and maybe you said, I'm sorry if I didn't hear, what is the parking ratio required for uh, that use? So that being those, those folks over 65 and older that have Alzheimer's, we're assuming that since they do not drive and they do not park, they're getting dropped off at the drop-off lane. Um, young adults who have them in their houses are dropping them off after work. It, there's not going to be nece necessarily parking needed for them. So that was sort of why we, we, we went that route. And, and, and Bobby Rieger, who I spoke with, said that because of that special use and just the type of people that are going to be dropped off, you know, their, um, their transportation situation, that the variants would be even more likely to get. So that's how you solved your needed 82 spaces, or I mean. So if I can, if I can also say one more time. At the beginning of the uh, presentation, said you needed 82 spaces. Mm -hmm. So is that how you solved it? Or so we did actually talk. Really we right? talked about a solution to come up with 82 spaces, right? Which was a parking garage. Right. right. Using um, some information that you would see in our appendix, we found that it costs fifty dollars and ninety-one cents on average in 2018, right now per square foot to pour and build a parking garage. So we did a little takeoff of the amount of space, the 8,000 square feet that's currently right in front of the building in between 75 and the building. So that right there, if we, if we built elevated parking would be 20 spaces. So if we needed 82, that's four floors. It's roughly $400,000 a floor to build. So that's over one and a half million dollars. So we took our route here with the construction costs of about 350 grand and thought that, that would be you know, a better cash flow, a, a better use of money, if you will. And we were able to solve that parking because we're adding on additional 45 parking spots and then the city variance will actually decrease the required ratio that we are needing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does anyone in the neighborhood pay for parking? Any of your neighbor properties have charged for parking? So there is an office space that's right across the street from our building, which I'm, I'm sure you've seen. It's a, it's a very nice facility, and we're actually acting under the assumption that there was surely paid for reserved parking there. Okay. <clears throat> Did you consider accessibility to Las Accessibility as far as um, for the folks. Now it's been inspected. You know, you're going to do a lot of work. You're going to create a. Uh, so, so, yeah. so when I went to go obtain the certificates of occupancy, I also pulled some permits and the current tenants have actually done some work to get it up to code, fire code. And so the restrooms really that are on the fourth floor are currently ADA accessible for wheelchairs. They have, they have enough space underneath to access, to access TAS standards for, for wheelchair requirements. So the fourth floor, as far as that goes with, with handicapped folks and people in the demographic that will actually be using that facility, that, that is up to code. Are you going to insure this building? Well, under uh, under the deed of trust, Capital One already makes sure that the property is insured. Okay. That is one of the because I don't see you perform. I'm, I'm nitpicking. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That's, 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 okay. Please, we, we're no. coaching. In the deed of trust, it states that the property is supposed to ha maintain proper insurance. So that's a Capital One requirement as well. So it should already be properly insured. And then, you, why did you flatline your taxes? <laughs> flatline our taxes? <laughs> We couldn't find the actual rate. Okay. Right. So what would be a good um, a good adjustment year to year as far as taxes go on the performance? Well, some are more on zero. Uh, we'll see the other problem as well with it being okay. with okay. it being a no, no, with please. it being a REIT, they're also subject to different taxes. And unfortunately we couldn't find that information to to be able to give you a true tax. I'd have to really dive into the REIT or the portfolio of it to find that information. I think Rich is talking about real estate tax, not tax to the yeah, not your uh, property tax. Yeah. Oh, property tax. <coughs> property yeah, especially what you make a year. Your taxes, your, your uh, 
or they're not, they're not either not showing up here in your your uh, operating expense, which. So our budget that was given to us didn't have a line item for property tax. We just opted not to use it. Okay. We weren't sure if it made it a three thousand dollar tax expense per year. Yeah. I, I like the research that you did. I like the research. Mm -hmm. you Absolutely. Okay. Great. You went to different sources. Yes. Yeah. You, you didn't just rely on one source. We put a lot of man hours in a lot of driving. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's fun though. It's a good time. Yeah. I'll do one more question. Oh, good. Did I catch here that uh, you were going to do spec suites or uh, yeah. you, you talked about your TI? Okay. 12,000 feet. Yeah. And I didn't know if you were going to do spec spaces with those or you were going to get a new tenant and give them a TI balance. Okay, so that eight dollar and forty four cent there would, would be included in a TI allowance. So that was just part of the construction company that we talked about previously. If you actually looked at their their bid proposal, which we kind of glanced over, I apologize for that. There was a hundred fifteen thousand dollar line item in there for tenant improvement, which included that eight dollar and forty four cent and the roughly twelve thousand five hundred square foot of vacant space. So that would be an allowance item. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, thank you for all your time and effort that you put into your presentations. They were amazing. We were blown away. Uh, you're our first annual case study competition teams, and uh, we couldn't be more proud of the uh, products that you produced. Your presentations were awesome. And so, uh, with that, I'm going to have the uh, case competition chair, Christy Clenny, come up and talk to you about uh, the experience today and yeah. feedback from the judges okay. and announce the winner. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, because we're so blown away and we were just like, I mean, this started as a little, little idea and this is, you know, it's now come to fruition. So we're amazed. So we have decided just off the cuff that we're actually going to give second and third prize to. So second prize will be $1,800 that you can divide amongst yourself and then $1,200 for third. So with that, do you have anything to add before I do the um, big huge announcement? Two things. One, I want to thank all of our coaches, all of our judges. These people gave a day of their time and a day in the time of a property manager is like gold. It, it, it costs more than money made. Um, I want to thank Julie. She's been amazing. She's, been, she's completely uh, removed herself from everything except her job, and that was to write the case, which was tough. Christy, it, you were uh, you're all so great, and this is I mean it's almost like yeah you're the winner, but there's also got to be you know second and third place. So third place is SMU. Second place is UTV. UNT.